All right, friends, here we are, ready for another installment of our uh, morning Bible study. Uh, we are in the book of James. In the last couple weeks, we did, uh, we covered some introductory material about who James is, when he was writing, to whom he was writing, why he was writing, what his writing looks like, and how it interacts with the rest of Scripture. Last week, we uh, got launched into... Uh, actual study of the text in James 1 and we made it down through verse uh, I believe it was through 15 so we're ready today uh, to finish probably um, the rest of chapter 1 uh, but we're in no rush so let's take a look at James 1 um, starting in verse 16 <clears throat> we'll read that paragraph there don't be deceived, my dear brothers. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. Um, verse 17 is probably in my top five favorite verses of scripture every good and perfect gift has come down from the father of the heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows um, that is a great encouragement so if you're looking for something to memorize for uh, for this week James 1 17 is an excellent uh, option for that uh, so let's uh, let's get a little deeper in this paragraph here uh, so in verse 16, it says, don't be deceived. A better translation is, stop fooling yourselves. Um, it's not that somebody else is trying to do the deceiving. It's that we tell ourselves things that are not necessarily true in order for us to kind of deal with, uh, with life. The, the fooling ourselves has to do with where the tempting or the enticement to sin comes from um, you know we've, we've talked about the, the the life cycle of temptation remember what we had up here last week where does it start starts with desire natural desires given by God we are tempted, and that leads to sin, and sin, if it is unforgiven, undealt with, ignored, leads to death, okay? Uh, that's sort of the, the life cycle of, uh, of desire. Um, again, we, we've, we've talked about the fact that the desires that we have are God given. He gives us a desire for companionship. He gives us a desire for intimacy, to know others and to be known deeply. Um, he, he gives us other uh, desires, other appetites. <coughs> so, uh, so, so we'll move, um, so we'll, we'll, we'll function. Um, and uh, God's enemy uses those natural God-given desires and fills them up with something else. It's not unlike a, a certain friend um, that has been with us for some time. We have a little bit of hunger. Uh, we have a desire for things that are good for us, that will sustain us, and this person keeps bringing buckets of chocolate to us, knowing that um, it will it'll scratch an itch, but it's pretty Probably not exactly the best thing it's for us. It's to sweeten everyone. Right. <laughs> it's well me, James. Not every week except the dentist week I fall into. <laughs> so, the, um, the statement is, don't fool yourselves anymore. This desire that you ha have to give in to desire, that's a dumb sentence, um, what we want to do, this, uh, the, the tempting that we feel to do things that are wrong 
or to enjoy things that are not godly, that doesn't come from God. He doesn't dangle this forbidden carrot out in front of us just to see what we'll do. Like, oh, what's he going to do? Is he going to go for it? Is she going to go for it? Oh, bad choice. Sorry, you failed. Um, that's not the way that God works. Um, he is a good father. He gives us good things. He gives good things to his children, not harmful things. Um, God doesn't send anything to us that would harm us. Nothing but good comes from him. Um, you know, J Jesus talks about the fact that, um, that God is a good father, uh, and he, com uh, he compares and contrasts God as a father to us as parents. Uh, you know, which of us, if our son or daughter asks for some food, would give them something that's not food. If they're looking for something or they need something that is beneficial would we'll give them something harmful. Uh, we, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't give our kid a snake if they wanted a fish. We wouldn't give them a rock if they were looking for an egg. Um, if, if we know how to good, be good parents and we're horrible copies of God the Father, absolutely he knows how to give things that are good. Um, good and perfect gifts. Uh, come down from our Father. <clears throat> uh, and part of the, that verse that I like the most is that he does not change by shifting shadows. God is constant. Uh, he created the heavenly bodies. They give us light. They reflect light. Um, the, the light changes. You know, uh, obviously the light this morning uh, is not like the light that it will be in 12 hours, it's not like it will be in the middle of the night. Uh, it's not like it will be at noon. The, the light changes through the course of the day because God, that's how God has planned it. But God himself does not change. Uh, he created the heavenly lights to do what they do, to create shadow, to bring illumination. But he doesn't change. God doesn't send things that harm us. He doesn't send things that will bring us death. God gives goodness and birth and life. A generous, unchanging God chose to make us his children, and that birth comes through God's own word. Um, uh, in uh, verse 18, uh, <clears throat> It's through Jesus, who is the living word of God, that we are reborn. We are born from above. Uh, and uh, um, he talks about um, first fruits, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. The first fruits offering in the Old Testament took place the day after uh, Passover Sabbath. Uh, it showed that everything comes from God and uh, everything belongs to him so uh, what James is saying is that God created us we belong to him our lives are not our own we offer ourselves back to him any comments or questions about verses 16 through 18 Jesus and Rosie Jesus is a first tree. He's a Passover lamb. If I had my my Bible app working correctly, I would look up the verse that talks about Jesus being uh, a first fruit, but it's no help to me today. No technology <laughs> is a help to me today. <clears throat> but that is all right. All right. Any other comments or questions? You perfectly understand those three verses and you're ready to move on? All right. Well, let's move on to verse 19. My dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. 
For man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. All right, verse 18 tells us that we have birth through the word. And so that's kind of like the next pearl on the, the necklace here. Um, James turns his focus to the word of God. And so this paragraph and um, a couple more following uh, really are, are dialed in to, uh, to God's word. Um, we, we need to listen to it. We need to receive um, God's word. We need to listen to and receive uh, the, the scriptures. Question. Yes? You know, in the book of John, what it says in the beginning, there was the word, and the word is actually Jesus. So is this word Jesus, or is this the Bible? Or is it the same? I don't know if you can separate them. Okay. They are not. They are obviously are not exactly the same. But I don't know that you can separate Jesus, the living Word of God, from the collection of Scripture that we have um, <clears throat> that teaches us about Him, records His life. Um, he yeah. he he came to show us the Word in action. And as we accept the living word of God as our savior, it, uh, it moves inside us into heart and mind, and it, uh, it is what changes us. Uh, Jesus is what saves us and, uh, and brings transformation. In, in verse 22, it says, but prove yourselves doers of the word. True. But let's not get too far ahead to verse 22. <laughs> we should be quick to listen. Take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen. Um, when I do um, couples counseling, either premarital counseling or otherwise, uh, the place we start is always communication. Communication takes two. There's giving and there's receiving. We're sending a message. We're receiving a message. Most of us are not really listening when we're in a conversation. Most of us are hearing. We hear the noise. We hear the words, but we're not really listening to them. We're constantly reloading. Instead of trying to listen for understanding, we're putting the next shells into the gun that fire back at them. Um, we don't want to just hear the noise. We want to listen to what's being said, to listen for understanding. We're not trying to defend ourselves or explain our actions or distract. Uh, we, we need to try to understand. You have the opportunity to learn something when you listen. If you're always talking, you're never going to learn. Okay? Um, it is impossibly hard to learn anything when you're talking all the time. Um, so God is speaking through his word, either through Jesus' the living word or through the written word of God. He's talking to us, and so we need to be quiet. Be quick to listen. It should be our, our fastest response. Ooh, I should pay attention to what's being said. The next piece, um, also pretty important. We're quick to listen and slow to speak. <clears throat> Sometimes the easiest way to avoid angry or I'll call it foolish speech is just to avoid speaking and to focus instead 
on listening to and understanding others. Um, maybe, maybe you've heard this. A wise old owl lived in an oak. The more he knew, the less he spoke. <clears throat> the less he spoke, the more he knew. And this same thing applies to you. Okay? It's good for us to listen. Um, it is good for us to not always feel like we have to speak all the time. Um, how many of you have gotten in trouble with your words in the last week? Okay. Often it's because we speak too quickly. Um, we speak out of our emotions without really thinking things through. Um, one of the things that I always appreciated about my mom's mom was that it was clear that she washed all of her language through her head about three different times before she said anything. <coughs> I, I, I deeply appreciate that about her still. Um, and at better points of my life, I have tried to emulate that. Not quite so much here recently because my people make me crazy. Um, but I ought to be working harder at that, thinking about the words that are going to come out before they do. I don't want to be afraid to speak when it's time to speak, but I shouldn't just open my mouth and start blah, 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 blah. I really am not being thoughtful or careful. Quick to listen, slow to speak, and the last piece of the trifecta here is slow to become angry. Um, in the Old Testament, God is described as being um, abounding in love and slow to anger. Uh, we read that a lot. Um, uh, if, if you were to flip back to Jonah chapter 4 verse 2, you would see that the prophet Jonah is getting angry because God is not getting angry. How are you, how are you not outraged? And he just sits and sulks and gets madder and madder as the day goes on. <clears throat> Why would James tell us to be um, slow to anger? Do you think? There's your time to think about it. Okay. Gives you time to think about it. And cool down and not be so <laughs> Maybe unclench the fist slowly. <laughs> Release that anger. <laughs> okay. Why would we want to do that? Why would we want to be slow to anger? Yeah, why would we why would we say, you know what? I'm gonna go outside for a minute. I'll be back. Why would why would we want to try to temper that anger, to to either slow it down or to reduce it to cool it off? Because it could cause irreversible damage. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, un do something stupid if I react right now. Un <laughs> unchecked rage uh, has caused a lot of doors to be replaced and walls to be patched and windows to be repaired and replaced. Those things can be fixed, but relationships, those are a lot harder to repair after a hulking, green, raging, monstrous fit of rage and anger. James says that our anger doesn't bring about the righteous life that God desires. Having anger, um, having an argumentative, battling, aggressive spirit will not help us to hear God. Uh, it won't help us to hear anybody else either. I think those things are, are tied together. Quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. As we deal with other people, they are inevitably and invariably, unquestionably, 
going to make us angry. That's what happens in relationships. There will be disagreements. There will be arguments. This is great advice um, that we need to shut our mouths and open our ears and get ourselves under control, uh, specifically the control of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> um, if you want to have a righteous life, which is what God wants for us, you won't develop that if you are um, con uh, if you're constantly dealing with an angry attitude, if, if you're letting that out. Uh, James tells us that we have to be ready to listen to God, and if we aren't ready, <coughs> then we won't accept what he has to say. We have to be quiet. Uh, it's impossible to talk and listen at the same time, which is why I hate um, news programs. Um, it's not really news programs, it's RT programs. They bring on two or three or four people to give different perspectives, and they, everybody's talking, nobody's listening. Um, that's all Facebook is. Everybody's talking, nobody's listening. Uh, and we all know how, how wonderful the Facebook universe is. It just brings people together with the spirit of love and unity and harmony. That's a beautiful thing, right? <clears throat> we need to be calm. We need to be controlled. Um, and the, the last thing there in verse 21 is that James tells us that we have to get rid of moral filth. Uh, the King James Version puts it this way. I'm not even sure I can pronounce all these words in one sentence. Lay apart all filthiness, all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. Whoa. <laughs> Lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. That's the key, James. The naughtiness part? No, that's <laughs> the yeah. that You know, we know th about things that are superfluous. <laughs> well, this is superfluity. Mm. I can't even figure out where to accent that. What, it, what James is writing that we should do um, to, to lay it apart or to get rid of it. Literally, he says to disrobe or unclothe or take off um, this filth like a suit of clothes. Um, if, if we had an appointment to meet with the Pope or the President or some other big important person, we would not wear the clothes in which we had cleaned the barn or changed the oil in the truck or gutted a deer. We would take those clothes off, we would change, um, and then we would, um, we would go into that appointment. We have a daily appointment with God, and our uh, James is not talking about actual clothing. It's not a wardrobe change. What he's talking about is that our lives should not be dressed in filth. Uh, we need to take those things off, and we need to we need to put those things far away from us um, to to put on a, a new suit of clothes. Uh, both the psalmist and uh, the prophet Isaiah talk about dressing ourselves in clothes of righteousness. Uh, Paul says in Philippians three that righteousness comes only through Christ. We we put him on like a new suit of clothes. He is our new outfit, our new wardrobe. Uh, we, we go into the closet and we put on our Jesus garment every single day. Um, from the moment that our feet hit the floor in the morning until we pick them up off the floor at night and all the time in between, we should make sure that we are dressed in the right clothes, that they're not filthy, superfluous or naughty <laughs> clothes, um, that they are clothes of the righteousness of Christ. <clears throat> the other thing that we're supposed to remove beyond um, this moral filth is the evil that is so prevalent, the overflowing 
of wickedness in our lives. The prevalent evil um, that is inside us will keep us from getting into God's word. And it, it absolutely keeps others from seeing our faith. If, if we're constantly um, sort of laid back and rolling around um, in all the things that we want to do, it's all about giving in to desire and temptation, people are not going to see Christ alive in us. It's bad for us, and it's also bad for anybody who's trying to see Christ alive in us. <clears throat> If we want to be able to hear the word, we can't do it rolling around in spiritual muck. Um, all, all wrapped up in dirty, filthy, naughty clothes. The word that we hear can save us, and it does save us. It is the truth about Jesus. That's the word that saves and changes us. And for those who already believe and who have accepted the word of Christ, we must fully employ and engage this truth in our lives, constantly growing in our understanding of both the written word and the living word, which is Jesus. We don't want to stay at this same low level. We want to constantly um, allow that word to grow in us and to, to, to transform us. Okay. Um, any uh, any thoughts or or comments about those verses there? Is there a particular part of that that feels more applicable to you than maybe another? I'm not asking. I'm not asking for confession. You don't need to go into gritty, gory detail, but. Well, I remember slopping pigs when I was little, and that was hard to get all that junk off the pigs. And even after you washed it off, still stick. You still smell like it for hours <laughs> or days. You, it's just I, in I your know. skin. I'm supposed to eat <laughs> Yes, you are because it's delicious. Well, that's like when Ricky came back from his year in Korea. He smelled like kimchi, and it was in his skin. <clears throat> All right. Well, let's continue to listen to the word. Let's move on here in verse 22. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. All right, so what do we do about the word? We're, we're quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. We want to focus on the word, which um, we're, we're, we're born of that word. We're the first fruits of it, um, and it has the power to save us and to change us. What do we do about it? Well, we have to listen to it and accept it. It is not enough to have heard what the word is. It is a significant responsibility to hear the word it must then be accompanied by our deeds. Do what it says. So it's one of the, the things that makes us different than Satan. Satan absolutely knows this book in and out. He, he knows what God says. He knows what God's will is. Um, he is a much better Bible scholar than anybody in this room ever will dream about being. The difference is 
that he has chosen to reject and to disobey, he will never apply it to his life. We have the opportunity, we can choose not just to know it, but to know it and to apply it to our lives, to really do what it says. <clears throat> Applying it has to be um, has to be a part of our study. This, this is a key idea in the book of James. You have this, you've accepted this, put it into practice. Do something with it. Um, this, this whole letter is not just about gaining more information, um, not just about memorizing God's truth. It is about putting feet and legs and hands and arms on it, making it work. Uh, it's one of the things that uh, that we've said about our small groups um, since we uh, launched them years ago. Our small groups are not intended to be Bible studies. We don't need more information. All of us have information. Like it, so at one point, if you're coming to church on Sunday morning, you're going to a Sunday school class, and then you're sitting in a sermon for a half an hour, and then um, you were in a Bible study during the week, and uh, you were also doing your own devotions during the week, and all those things were about 27 different directions in the Bible. About money, about sex, about relationships, about personal responsibility, about holiness, about all these kinds of things. And there's so much information, you're just drinking from the fire hose, and you can't do any of it. You're just totally blown away and overwhelmed by all of it. I, I can't process it, okay? So when we started our small groups, the idea was, we want to focus on the truth that you already have. Let's find ways together that we can put this truth into practice. The small group that I lead talks about the sermons. And how we can further apply the truth that we've uh, we've heard on Sunday morning. <clears throat> now, uh, the small groups have kind of gone and done their own thing, and, and that's fine. But what we really all need to focus on is applying the truth that we've already received. You go all the way through the Bible, you study book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. You know it inside and out. You know all the background and all the details and all the highlights and the low points of every story. You got it all, but you don't apply it. All of it was a waste. It has to be applied to life. <clears throat> um, James says that um, he, he sort of paints this picture of a guy who gets up in the morning, he goes, he looks at himself in the mirror for hours, and then five minutes after he leaves the mirror, sees himself and says, who's that guy? I don't recognize him. Uh, the word, like a mirror, shows us what we really look like. It shows us that we need attention. I'm, I'm assuming that you are better about this than I am. I, I do not want to look in the mirror currently. For one, the light in our little bathroom under the stairs is bad. Nobody looks good in that. Um, we, we, we get up in the morning and we go and we lean on the vanity and we look into it and go, oh, rough night. Those are, those are, those are pretty puffy. Um, that's swollen. Oh my gosh, what is this thing growing on my forehead? Uh, my hair is a disaster. Um, where is the makeup? Forget makeup. Where is the spackle and the trowel? I gotta figure this out. Okay. <clears throat> the word, um, the word does that for us. We we hold that word up and we go, boy. Really, I've been really shooting my mouth off a lot here lately. I have, I have not been careful when I've been talking. I have not been loving 
to my spouse or to my children. I have not been a great example to uh, the, the neighborhood. Um, I kicked the dog, I swore at the cat. I've been a horrible human um, in the last 24 hours. I, I've got to be better. I, I need for God's word to work through my life and to make changes in me, okay? The word is, is what we bounce ourselves off of, not somebody else. Now, I can, I can hold myself up against a lot of other people and go, I look great. I look amazing. You know, the, the last time I was around some of my, uh, my high school classmates, some of them are really old, and they really look awful, and I think, Compared to you all, I should be on the cover of Men's Health magazine. I look, uh, I look so much better than some of them do. And then I put myself up against another friend from that era and go, yeah, that's, that's, that's not so great. Okay, the the standard is not somebody else. The standard is uh, is God's word. <clears throat> There is a process um, that's pointed out in various pieces through the Bible about what we do with the word. We listen to it, we, we hear it, um, and then we, we study it, we open it up, uh, we read it, we go deep, we pick it apart, we research it, we, we study. Um, and as we do that, we understand the word. We, we, we know this is what it means. Um, and, and, and that is not the end. It's not enough for us to just say, well, I, I know exactly what this passage means. And we also have to believe it. Like, okay, I, I believe God is telling you the truth here and that something, um, something needs to happen as a result of this. Um, the, the next step is, after we believe it, we meditate on it. We allow that truth to bang around in our hearts and our brains. Um, we, we think about it all day long. I prefer marinating to meditating. Um, I want to I wanna soak in that and have it sort of permeate every nook and cranny. Um, and then hopefully, after we've allowed that to... to um, to go through our heart, mind, and soul, then we're ready to apply that truth in our lives. We, we've read it, we've understood it, we, we understand how important it is and what it can do for us, and then the last piece is that we apply it. We move beyond meditating on it and thinking about it uh, to, uh, to engaging it. It doesn't do us any good to read and study and understand God's truth unless we also put it into practice. Um, a person is going to be blessed for four things concerning the word. Um, it is intentional and penetrating. Number two is that it is done continually. That's back in Psalm 1. Uh, meditates on God's word. Uh, on God's law day and night. Um, the word is understood and remembered, and it is put into practice. If, if we'll do those four things, we go to it intentionally and allow it to get inside us. We are doing it continually. We are understanding and remembering it, and we, then we put it into practice. If we'll do those things, we will be blessed by the word. And James says, this is the perfect law, the sum of all of God's revelation. He's not just talking about the law of Moses from the Old Testament, but this law, which is the big revelation about Jesus and salvation, um, it isn't enforced with chains and bonds and slavery. It is chosen to be obeyed by every man and every woman. Um, rather than um, following that law out of obligation or fear or some other negative 
motivation. We obey that law of Christ out of devotion for the freedom that it brings and for the life that it brings. You know, Jesus said he, uh, he, didn't, uh, he came to bring an abundant life, to be rich and full. It's not one of duty and slavery and obligation. Okay, uh, any, any thoughts or comments? Well, this kind of goes, I'm just sitting there and just popped in my brain, you know, I, when you muck out a stall or whatever, I mean, you get dirt, you get dirty, which what you referred to there, and then God's word and the love of him can fill into those cracks and penetrate. So it can work through that dirty cracked surface. Well, and and the, the word is what washes us. Isn't it Peter that talks about the washing with water through the word? Um, it's, it's what scrubs away all of that crud. We, we take it off um, and the word continues to wash us clean to get off every trace of all that grody grunginess that we, uh, we seem to like to roll around in. Okay, moving on. You all seem very sheepish. Verse 26. <clears throat> if anyone considers himself religious and yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself and his religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. All right, we, we hear the word we, because we're quick to listen and slow to speak. Um, we, we look at, at ourselves in the mirror that the word is. We see the changes that um, need to be made. We allow that word to work through us. Um, to invade all the areas of our life and to, to change us, we do what the Word says. So the, uh, the emphasis has been on what we can do. What does the Word say? That's what we're going to do. He kind of, uh, again, sort of turns a corner just a little bit here and um, looks at a couple of very practical ideas. First, we do what the Word says by controlling our tongues. Uh, James is going to talk about this again in chapter 3. It just kind of throws out a little bit of a teaser right now. Um, by being slow to speak and controlling our tongue, being careful and thoughtful about our language is a very obvious way for Christians to demonstrate their faith in Christ. It might be hard to tell if somebody is a believer in Christ, but it is not as difficult to tell if somebody is not by the things that they say. Say it again, please. I'm not sure if I can. <clears throat> it is not always easy to tell if somebody is a believer in Christ, but I think it's much easier to tell if somebody is not a believer in Christ by their words. <clears throat> okay, there are a lot of really sweet diplomatic controlled people that um, that have absolute control of their mouths. When you listen to them speak, you may or may not know if they're a follower of Christ, but you can almost always tell if somebody is not by how they how they talk. Um, Even if somebody professes to be a follower of Jesus, you can tell how serious they are by the words that they use, um, either by their vocabulary or the topics um, that they, they talk about. Um, James says here that not keeping control of your tongue is to fool yourself. You can't really worship God if your mouth is out of control. Whether you're showing that, not just with like swearing, cursing, 
but also things like gossip, slander, lies. Those are also oral sins. Those are things that our, our mouth gets us in trouble for. <clears throat> How can we worship God? How can we really be following Christ if everything that comes out of our mouth is gossipy, slanderous, lying, coarse, vulgar talk? What is it that Jesus says about our words? It is out of the overflow of the heart that the mouth speaks. Um, it's one of the things that I have tried to impress on youth groups um, since I started in ministry uh, and have, have had um, to, to try to emphasize to my own children is that if the things that are coming out of your mouth are harsh, angry, bitter, untruthful, hurtful things, it's probably because your heart really hasn't been affected by Jesus. How can you say that you love Jesus if everything that you say is critical and negative and uh, damaging to other people? <clears throat> okay. Um, if you, you think you're religious, you think you're following God, but you don't have control over your mouth, you are lying to yourself about who and what you are. <clears throat> uh, another practical area beyond our <coughs> speech <clears throat> that James talks about is what we do for those people who are in need. <clears throat> okay, we've, we've, we've said that we want to do what the Word says by keeping ourselves um, away from the world's dirtiness um, the word that is, uh, James uses here for religion has to do with the external facet of it. Um, it's the, the visible outward execution of what we say we believe. It's measurable religion. So what he's saying here is if you really fear and worship the Lord, you have pure religion. Uh, we have such real devotion to God's word that it can be observed and judged. Um, we're, we're serious about doing what God's word says. If we look in the Old Testament, uh, we'll, we'll see um, several commands to care for the fatherless and the widows. Nobody is allowed to take advantage of them. Um, to do so is sinful. Um, the fatherless and the widows, the, the orphan uh, and, um, and the grieving are a special class and they are supposed to be cared for by God and by God's people. Uh, we'll, we'll just look up a couple of those in Exodus 22. Exodus 22, 22. Just a nice short verse. Do not take advantage of a widow or an orphan, period. Uh, and then, and then uh, God says, if you do and they cry out to me, I will certainly hear their cry. My anger will be aroused and I will kill you with the sword. Your wives will become widows and your children will, will become fatherless. Okay, let's not mess around with them. Uh, how about Deuteronomy? <clears throat> Numbers, Deuteronomy 10, verse 18. You've heard this before. The Lord is the one being spoken about here in Deuteronomy 10, 18. The Lord defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow and loves the alien, giving him food and clothing. He defends the cause of orphans and widows. He stands up for him. If we're following him, we should be standing up for him too. Not just not taking advantage of them, but working for their advantage, helping them out. Uh, how about Deuteronomy 24, just a few pages over. Deuteronomy 24, 
Uh, and there's um, a handful of verses here. So let's look at 2417. Do not deprive the alien or the fatherless of justice or take the cloak of the widow as a pledge. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and the Lord your God redeemed you from there. That is why I command you to do this. When you are harvesting in your field and you overlook a sheaf, don't go back for it. Leave it for the alien, the fatherless, and the widow so that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. When you beat the olives from your trees, do not go over the branches a second time. Leave what remains for the alien, the fatherless, and the widow. When you harvest the grapes in your vineyard, don't go over the vines again. Leave what remains for the alien, the fatherless, and the widow. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt. This is why I command you to do this. So Ruth was an alien. And Naomi was a widow. A widow. So an alien is a Gentile. It's not an a alien would be somebody who is not a part of the 12 tribes, at least in the book of Deuteronomy. Mine says foreigner. Yeah. Foreigner. Okay, Ruth, Ruth and Naomi came back from Moab back to uh, back to uh, Naomi's home, functionally destitute, and because of that law, Ruth and Naomi didn't start the death. They were allowed to go through, and and what is it? What did Boaz tell his workers to do? Leave. Yeah. Just. Throw a couple bundles back there behind. Don't, don't look yeah. back. Just toss them out there. Yeah. Boaz is a righteous man. He's following those those laws from the book of Deuteronomy, making sure that um, that widows and orphans and and strangers, foreigners, um, are are being cared for. I'm not sure how exactly we would apply that approach to our lives, but absolutely um, it's incumbent on us to take care of orphans and widows in their distress. If we really believe that we are upstanding, righteous followers of God, we cannot ignore taking care of orphans and widows. I'll take care of you, you take care of me. <laughs> yeah, but it, later on in the New Testament, it says, yet, if a widow has a family, children, they should be taken care of her. And if she's young enough. Right, she should get remarried. She should, well, she should get busy. <laughs> get a job. No, I had some. Yeah, one. but we're so busy. We're mowing our own yard and all those things. Yeah. In our own house and fixing our own cars. No, I had somebody one time when I was sick tell me, well, yes, I was very children. good to come over and mow my yard. We have children <laughs> to take care of you. Why should we bring you soon? Yeah, we're going to bring our kids. She didn't know a lot in the Bible. <clears throat> genuine religion is much more than just the superficial observable acts that's, that's one of the things that Jesus railed against with the Pharisees it's not just about what it looks like on the outside yeah you could do this you could write a check you could you know have photo ops with it this orphan and with, with these old ladies absolutely can do that but you you won't fool anybody but yourself um, what what real religion real faithfulness to God is about is, is action action that is prompted not by motivation to look good but by the motivation um, to to be faithful to God's truth. We've seen the truth, 
God defends the cause of the, the widow and the orphan. And so because we're following him, we ought to take up that, that same cause. Uh, a man or woman with genuine religious experience will live a life marked by love for others and holiness before God. If you won't control your mouth and you won't take care of those in need, that shows that your religion, whatever that is, doesn't have any power, it has no success, and it is of no use or purpose. It is empty. It is pointless. And God does not accept it. The right kind of religion, the proper sort of devotion to God, is to care for those in need and to remain spotless, pure, and untarnished uh, by the stuff that is around us. And that's how James wraps up that section. Do you got any further thoughts or remarks about these very troubling words that James gives to us? This is the New Testament Proverbs. All right. Well, we will pick up next time in two weeks with James chapter 2. Let me encourage you in the meantime to go back over chapter 1 and over chapter 1 and over chapter 1 uh, and uh, we'll see what kind of progress we've made uh, when we get together again in two weeks. So if you're out there watching on YouTube, thanks. Be sure to subscribe to our channel so you don't miss any of our content. We'd love to hear from you.